So hi everyone. We'll give people a minute to trickle on in, and then we will uh, we will get started. I don't actually understand the logic between when you hit open it and when it like people actually get to go in because sometimes it like takes people a little while and things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, okay. So hi everyone. Um, I'm Jacqueline Nolis. I'm the chief product officer at Saturn Cloud, and today joined with me is uh, Ian Rees Stokes, who is the associate director. Um, as an associate director at BCG Gamma, which is a big fancy consulting firm. Um, but before uh, we do on that, uh, Ian, can you tell us just a little bit about like what your job is, what your role is, and what, you know, for in more detail, like what, is, uh, what does BCG Gamma do? Sure, thanks, Jacqueline. So um, BCG is a global management consulting firm. So I think about 30,000 employees around 200 or more offices around the world. Um, the company's been around since the late 60s. Gamma is only about six years old, and it's an advanced analytics arm of BCG as a consulting firm. And what we normally do is focus on uh, predominantly enterprise clients and the, problem, the problems, challenges, opportunities they have in running their business or with their products or clients, the markets that they're in, or new geographies, this kind of thing. And... Uh, about six, seven years ago, we saw that there was a great opportunity to bring our consulting engagements intersected with analytics capabilities in a more intentional way. And so we set up a whole division, which now has about a thousand people in around 60 offices, but one in three of our offices have a gamma contingent located there. And um, so I'm part of that organization. And I'm out of the New York City office. You see my, my background here. And my responsibility is to take uh, work with our consulting teams to take um, kind of insightful data analytics and make sure that we've got uh, a package technical solution that we can hand over to our clients. My background is in large scale high performance computing. Um, and one of the challenges that you can often have with data scientists, they can get something really exciting and interesting working on their laptop or on a cloud environment for them, but then have challenges with issues around scaling and reproducibility and kind of hand over to like an IT operations team and production components, that sort of thing. So my background in software engineering and systems engineering and large scale you know, product development, deployment, enterprise computing, I'm, I'm part of a group that helps our data scientist teams um, take their work and put it in a version that then our clients can really benefit from after we leave. We really try and get in, do something exciting and get out. We're not trying to get in and be there forever. Our projects are usually measured in like single digit months. Um, and But we want our clients to be able to keep benefiting for years afterwards from the work that we've done for them. So that's kind of who I am and what I do in my background. Briefly. Okay, okay. So I'm going to say something and I'll be like, is this what you do? And you're like, that's not how it works, which is I could imagine, or maybe it's exactly like where it works, but we'll yeah. We'll so, so you, by helping them deliver the like, okay, here's the end result. So I, for the audience members, I've been a consultant for many years previously too. And there's like a, there's kind of like a big at the end handoff that often happens. We're like, here's how it goes. Is it like you get called like two weeks before, like, oh, hey, by the way, can you help us make this like a good handoff? Or like, how early do you get involved in the process to make sure that things get good when they're handed over? So that's a great question. Um, when I joined... BCG Gamma four years ago. At that point, there were about 250 uh, data science consultants around the world. And we were just getting to that pain point of, oh dear, it runs on the consultant's laptop, but we have lots of problems handing this over to, the, to our clients. Super powerful, capable work, but challenges in terms of client adoption and all those things I mentioned earlier, right? And so there was a there was a specific push to say we got to do this better. We got to do this better for us. We got to do this better for our clients. So I was part of a first wave of bringing in people with more systems and software engineering experience. But what that meant was my first two years at BCG, I did have a lot of firefighting calls. Um, best case scenario, we would have teams which looked after themselves and they went in the right direction. We hired enough other people with like kind of backgrounds like mine that they were engaged early enough on that things were on the right path. Um, 
but I did a lot of firefighting. So I, I worked with a lot of projects all over the world where it was what you just said, like two weeks to delivery. And we actually have just realized we're not sure we've got something that's ready for our client. And we have a strong commitment to our client to make sure they get what they paid for. And so we do what we have to do. And so I would come in maybe myself, but often myself plus one or two other people. And we would then bring in that like, okay, we got to harden this thing. We got to start out the, any of the issues. And we got to make sure that we've got um, something that's high quality for our clients. This is a little bit like looking behind the curtain and BCG <laughs> process, but you know, I think a lot of people realize that that's kind of uh, the well-known secret yeah. aspects of what you do. Cause it's a reality even for a lot of projects, right? You run into hot water and then you're like, how do we get, get out of this? And sometimes it happens and sometimes it even happens at consulting firms like BCG. So I did a lot of firefighting my first couple of years, but. Okay, well, we could say in like a hypothetical <laughs> consulting company, maybe DC two years, yeah. yeah. Um, so, okay, but continue on with the, like the consulting thing. Um, yes. So to your point, you know, like consulting, you're, you're on these projects, they don't last that many months, you gotta get results out fast. When I think about making things reproducible, like there's a whole range of things, right? Like you could go from anywhere to like, everything's in a Git repo and everything's documented and you're only using packages that are really common and everyone will always have access to. And, and, and like, you could go like, like put this in an archive in a bunker in Antarctica, this is gonna work so well. And then there's literally, well, it ran once, so we're done with, like, how do you decide where the right cutoff is uh, when consulting? That's a great question as well. So it's um, really a matter of ensuring that what we're doing is fit for purpose. So one of the key things that, that uh, I've enjoyed about my experience at BCG is that the BCG partners and the senior leaders work closely with our clients to make sure we understand what it is that we're aiming for from a business perspective. And once we're clear on what we're aiming for from a business perspective, then actually getting data science teams together to do that work where we know what the boundaries are. We were basically like, what are our terms of reference and what we're gonna be building towards? And what that comes down to in like somewhat more practical terms is really um, where we have a uh, like a three tier uh, process that we look at in BCG. We categorize the projects that we're taking on either as um, like identify the opportunity, uh, which is really generally investigative. Is there something interesting that we can do here? And this might be like two weeks of work or it might be six weeks of work, but it's like still a, a, an engagement with the team. Then we have a proof of concept phase and proof of concept phase is what are you gonna get at the end of this? You're gonna get at the end of this, like a report with some slides and we will have written a bunch of code and done a bunch of stuff, but it's all like just proof of concept. It's offline. Um, it's like with a small set of data. It's not with any objective that the proof of concept will become an operational system after we're finished, but the proof of concept will help us do exactly that. It'll prove the value. It'll help establish what's the business opportunity around the analytics, the data, the approach. It'll inform us. And then from there, there's then the third stage, which is building from a BCG perspective which is the kind of the MVP approach. And so the MVP approach or pilot will, will be um, creating something which is a kind of preliminary production oriented system, but production with a small geography or a small market sector or user, user sector, something like that. And we build that out with then, a, with then a path that we can clearly chart for how our clients could then scale that up. Occasionally we get into a fourth category, which is build what we call build operate transfer transfer, where we take the MVP and we do a build out and then we do operate and transfer, but transfer is really important to us. We really aim to, as I was saying earlier, like our projects are almost always um, single digit months in duration and we might have a chain of those, but we generally are looking to empower our clients as opposed to embed ourselves in their organization. We wanna go after the next big uh, big opportunity with that client, as opposed to be forever the owners of this capability that we've developed for them. Well, it's interesting because like what you're talking about, I think it makes sense. And it's also, it doesn't sound like it's actually particularly specific to consulting, right? The idea of like, do the POC, have that kind of be done, then do the MVP, like that kind of, I have heard people talk about that in contexts outside of consulting. Like it's, it's interesting that there may be, it, it's, I, from what you're saying, it doesn't sound like it's wildly different if you've never been in consulting before or you've only been in consulting. It's not like you're gonna have a huge culture, sh you know, shock necessarily when you're switching. 
Yeah, um, I, I would say that that approach is, I, I think is a best practice approach for even like kind of any business. Um, that said, I think a lot of a lot of organizations will just have a more continuous plan for building out like the production system right from the start as opposed to the distinct phases. Definitely, I'd say one of the advantages of us being in a consulting mode is that as much as we hope that there'll be a chain of subsequent phases that probably in some way we can be engaged in, uh, we have to plan and execute on the basis of, um, you know, a two to six week, uh, one to three months, three to six months, or six to 18 months, depending on those three plus one phases that I described. And so we've got to have like these clear cutoff points, the client gets value, there's a clear handover, and there's a, there's a definite exit point for us at the end of each of those phases. And that's a key part of building, building trust. We, don't, we can't like cheat and say, oh, we can fix this in the next phase because we can't assume we're gonna be present for the next phase. Well, I was gonna say, and I actually don't know if this is better or worse in consulting, but I do feel like there's a problem of like, you do some work and then you forget about it. And then a year later, someone's like, oh, can you run it again? And you're gonna be like, oh God, can I like, like did, did I actually make a reproducible? I, I gotta find out. So I guess one, does that, problems show up in consulting? I can imagine yes, because like a client comes back, but like I'd interested to hear how much that shows up in consulting. And then given your particular role as a person who thinks about this a lot, like what do you do when you're like, someone's like, hey, reproduce this thing from a year ago and it, you, you regret it what you had left it as um, before. So, so those challenges come up if there's a big gap between um, a proof of concept phase and then a later MVP phase. Um, we often will be doing the proof of concept as a, as a lead into an MVP and there might be like a one or two month gap, but uh, at times that gap can grow it a lot more and then it's more challenging because the proof of concept is not meant to be um, the translation, but the detailed experience gained, uh, that definitely can be lost as much as we work to capture um, kind of our design process and our insights. Um, a lot of the, the real hard earned experience exists in people's heads uh, from those proof of concept phases. So internally, we do a lot of work around our uh, like asset management and how we you know, manage like the, the, the resources that we're creating that describe our designs and so on and so forth. We also have um, in the last year really blanketed our projects with the use of CICD systems. We you know, we now have uh, like 100% coverage of all code is in revision control systems and people actually like using them correctly, which not so many years ago, it was right. Not so many years ago, it was hard to find data scientists who had like real genuine experience with proper use of revision control, first for themselves and then second in a team setting. And then thirdly, in a context of like release management and handover to clients. And today, uh, BCG, um, our frontier of like, what's our next frontier of doing these sorts of things well, would really be more on, are we effectively leveraging our CI CD systems? How are we putting in place testing and test system, that kind of thing. But reproducibility is super important. Some of the key things that we do, we got to a really long list of uh, processes and tools that we put in place to help ensure that our, you know, 400 plus projects a year that we execute on um, have the right levels of reproducibility and quality. Um, but one of them that I'll mention is that we have an internal process called delivery excellence. We have a delivery excellence panel of about 20 people from around the world that get together every week to review all projects. They're measured on a couple of different axes and we look at them, the projects on a, on a chart and then say, okay, which are ones that are potentially in hot water on a trajectory you're worried about. And that includes like audits of what they're doing, uh, their processes, the client requirements, the data, path to delivery, clarity of what the delivery should be. Um, and that helps us make sure that we, we have some um, objective verification that there's reproducibility in the process and that the team's thinking about reproducibility from uh, not the first step, because that's often inappropriate, but at least by the time you get four or six weeks into a project, but the idea of can we reproduce the work that we're doing right now, especially when you start talking about the analytics and data science parts. And again, in that space, there's I think there's still open challenges for like what is the best practice around data versioning, around configuration management, around model training, like the number of different things that you have to kind of like version and snapshot and understand provenance. Uh, it's it's daunting, and um, I'd say we still don't have like a perfect solution there, but 
we do a pretty good job of thinking about it intentionally and blending together a number of different tools and processes to help us. Yeah. Uh, okay. So first off, brief time out. If you're in the audience and you're listening to this, please feel free to ask questions. I forgot to mention this. There's a Q and A thing at the bottom. Feel free to ask questions. We'll be having some time at the end to answer your questions. So if anything we talk about makes you want to ask a question, do it. Okay. Back in. You know, I was just thinking about this. I remember, I think it was maybe even like 2016, I was interviewing for a position and I asked them at the company, hey, what do you do for reproducible code? And they said, well, a few geeky people on the data science team use Git, but eh. it was kind of like, a, uh, and like, that is so staggering compared to 2022. Like, I do think there's been a dramatic shift in eight years from Git was like, okay, if you're like one of those, you know, real, like, like the real feisty types, you can skip, but normally don't. Now it's like, if you don't use Git, you kind of get like a scoring look a little bit. And I, I think that's just a culture change. The tool hasn't changed. All that happened is finally we got everyone on board. So to your point, I do wonder in like five years, maybe CICD sort of tools will hit that point as well. We're like, what do you mean you don't know how to um, have your code deploy, blah, blah, blah. And not to say that if you're listening to this and you're like, oh goodness, I don't know CICD, I'm in trouble. Like, I'm sure you will pick it up. Like everyone picked up Git. Like, but I, I, I think that it's good that we're kind of coalescing as a field on those sorts of things. Um, okay, so uh, I wanna ask you about some different things. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, like leading a data science team because I know that's the thing you think about a lot because you kind of have to be as like a leader. Um, so I guess to just kind of on the topic of like actually leading the data science team and data scientists, like what are like, just real quick, what are skills you look for when you are hiring and like managing a team? You know, like what's important? So, um... BCG has, uh, for somebody like myself, it comes from a startup and academic background. Um, it was a bit of a culture shock to join BCG, which has uh, effectively like a six tier system for, um, you know, where you stand. And it's very clear you get promoted every, you know, two to three years from one step to the next. And like people are familiar with management consulting have heard of this system before, right? And I'd kind of like heard of it, but experiencing is quite a different thing. And somebody who's worked in like super flat organizations, uh, I felt pretty daunted by it. That's kind of like my, my lead in to the appreciation that I've gained over the last four years of BCG of the, um, the strength of teams where there's clear roles and responsibility and where you have like a people first mentality uh, in the leadership to set up the right kind of structures for um, mentoring and feedback and accountability, um, communication lines and who's responsible for communicating to who on what subjects. These are key parts of the way we organize our teams. And so it's critical that uh, anyone at our project leader or above level and uh, like really it's um, as much as it is hierarchical, there's not a lot of hierarchies. You basically have data scientists, senior data scientists, lead data scientists, and then associate directors. After that, you're at the partner level, which is like kind of a business selling business and, and client facing as opposed to project execution role. Um, and so at the project leader or associate director level, having people who have absolutely the right level of technical expertise and insight understanding of the systems, um, the math, because we're a data science and analytics organization, um, the IT considerations, the software considerations for actually building software, because we are building and writing tons of software. You know, our, our best teams are spending 80% of their time um, writing code. Um, you've got to understand those pieces, but you have to be able to lead, you have to be able to lead teams and leading teams isn't telling people what to do. Leading teams is being able to um, coach and manage people, to motivate people under, you know, typical consulting environments, which can be at times very stressful and appreciating the, the human dimension. So I think those are some of the key things that we really look for, like good evidence of very strong communication skills, strong people skills, an ability to be a leader that, um, knows how to find like every carrot available and they have to go look really hard if they need to go find a stick kind of thing. So it's really like a carrot-based organization is one of the way I, I describe BCG and the, the way we deal with leadership. And also feedback at a level that people are prepared to give feedback really, um, really regularly and through a number of different channels. Um, so those I'd say are some of the key things that we, that we look for. Um, 
when we're looking for leadership uh, within a within a BCG uh, team context. Yeah, no, I think it's just the leadership thing, I think is especially interesting, because like I was talking to someone recently who was like just started being a data science manager and wanted to know like, like, what are the things to make a good leader and like I did not maybe this off the spot or whatever, but I did not have a very nice simple answer because I'm like, I don't know, I just messed it up for a very long time and eventually I messed it up less and now I'm kind of at the level I'm at like it just, which is to say it just feels like you can't like I don't think you can learn it in the same way you can learn like linear algebra, right? Like it's 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 such an important skill, but it's also so ephemeral. Like it's so hard to like just pin down. Um, so I don't know. I just, I find that a very interesting uh, given what you're saying. Yeah, I, so I would say that something that's um, built into the DNA of BCG and I think a few of the other top shelf consulting firms as well is uh, a very strong corporate culture around organization and leadership and roles and expectations on teams. And that's kind of independent from the analytics data science aspect. Although I def it's definitely the case that working with a group of engineers and data scientists requires some adjustments to the processes and the mechanisms by which you organize and lead that team. But that said, um, BCG has particular team organization and leadership style they know how important it is to establish that in the culture. And because people will be changing the teams that they're on every you know, three months, five months, six months, we need people to be landing on a team and understanding their place on the first or second day they're on that project because they need to be like executing and delivering as a high as like a high functioning team by the end of their first week. And normally we think about these things as processes which take like months to, to take place, but BCG teams like your project's done after a few months. And so because of that, we, we do a lot of internal training depending on your career level, like in different contexts, but around what, what does a successful team look like? You know, so a big part of my role is to actually be coaching my own teams. The current team I'm working with is a lot of people who are brand new to BCG. Um, and therefore there's like a double burden for me to be reminding everybody, but in this case, even introducing people to what our BCG expectations are around um, roles, responsibilities, communication, um, accountability, um, you know, giving advanced heads up on situations, knowing when to ask for help and when to kind of soldier on on your own, um, trying to solve things and getting that kind of balance right. And so I, I think a lot of the training that we do, there's BCG wide training, then we have gamma specific training um, that talks about how do we execute effectively as um, like world class analytics data science teams that can deliver um, high impact um, technical systems to our clients. Yeah, well, and I think kind of what you were saying before about the hierarchy and stuff, to your point, I do think management consulting is a field that generally has more levels of hierarchy. But to, I've also, I've personally been at companies where they've had a ton of hierarchy or very little hierarchy. It's almost like disconnected from how effectively the team runs, because it's not a question of how many like levels you have. It's a question of like, can someone who is at a lower level say something to someone at a higher level and have that be listened to? Which is, I guess, my question for you is, are there things you try and do in your role to help with that hierarchy communication? Like just to make sure, to your point before of like, you gotta know your place you go in, you can't just walk up to the partner at a consulting firm and tell you you're doing wrong. But at the same time, like creating a culture where someone can speak up if they wanna say something. Um, That's yeah, maybe a right. really tricky question. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I think I've got a decent answer for it. So um, that's absolutely critical. BCG operates on the basis of people having leverage. We use this term leverage all the time. And so the idea is is that uh, I'm right now working on developing um, a an analytics banking platform. And so I'm providing leverage for a group of partners who are selling into the banking space. Um, advanced analytics capabilities for banks around the world. And so I am their leverage in terms of giving them another sales asset that they can take. Now I'm not implementing that myself. My leverage comes from having a team where my team is structured in a way that I have a lead front end developer and my lead front end developer has a more junior developer working with him. And that's his leverage that he's able to uh, accelerate the overall package of work that he's able to deliver on our front end development between him and working 
with the more junior develop, developer that he's partnered with. And that repeats itself a few other times across my individual team, right? So when we do this in a way where there's good communication and when exactly your point, Jacqueline, that people can be listened to, that even the junior person can talk to the more senior lead front end developer, that more junior person who actually contacted me on Monday after we had our started sprint planning. She kind of like jumped up two levels and said, could I get 30 minutes of your time? We spent 30 minutes and we talked through what our like 10 person sprint kickoff uh, had covered because she had some questions and she, you know, they were, she wasn't trying to bypass someone, but it felt to her more appropriate to talk to me and they were bigger picture questions of what we're trying to achieve. And she's totally open to do that. And I listened to her and we talked about it. I gave her some feedback and I got some ideas from some of the comments she provided. So people are respected and given avenues in which they can uh, give their feedback. And this system can work really well. You get leverage through the system. We call it having a strong pyramid. And so, uh, you know, one of the concepts in BCG is building this pyramid. And when I joined BCG, I thought that sounded strange. Like, I'm not a pyramid builder. I'm here to, like, help create a successful organization and deliver value to our clients and do some interesting, exciting data science and analytics, which is the thing I love. And I'm not here to build my pyramid, right, that I sit at the top of. And so it sounded weird to me. But uh, four years later, I could say, actually, I can see the strength of this system when it's done with the right level of respect. And the feedback and the communication mechanisms we put in place, um, you know, daily standups are good places for people to be open to be able to share what are their blockers and what are their issues, sprint retrospectives, which are now standard, a bunch of the software engineers that have joined this organization for these agile concepts that weren't really very well adopted, I would say, by data scientists not too many years ago. I think it's now getting more encultured in the data science community. These patterns, which over the last decade have um, proven themselves in the, like, the tech area, they're now being adopted more by data science teams. And I can tell you within the thousand people we have in Gamma, these are pretty common. It was like hard to talk about these things four years ago when I joined, and now it would be surprising if you didn't, right? So sprint retrospectives is feedback mechanisms. But a couple other important channels that we have as well. We have a weekly anonymous survey that's standardized across BCG, but set up on a per project basis um, with concepts like, uh, do you feel like you're learning and meeting your development goals? Is there clear communication within your team? Do you feel supported? Are we do, do you feel like we're building value for our, for our client? Um, and people respond to these and I get like each week I get 10 responses and we look at them and we talk about them as a team, but the responses are completely anonymous. This is a great feedback mechanism. Very low cost. It still, like takes five or 10 minutes to fill it in. Um, and on top of that, we, we have some external person, I mean, not ex external to the team, but part of BCG, who once or twice a month will do 10 or 15 minute one-on-ones where people can say, uh, yeah, this is a great team. I love it. It's amazing. It's like, what we're doing is world-class. And other people like, uh, Ian talks too much <laughs> or he's not clear on what oh, no. he, wants, he wants our team to achieve, right? And so they can share that in kind of a semi-anonymous way. Um, so there's more of like a human connection in the conversation and you can dig a little bit more for things that are going on. And that's a great feedback mechanism. Sometimes team leaders can do that, but sometimes the team leaders are part of like the interpersonal communication dynamic that makes that tough. So I think team, like for people who are listening to this, I think that technique is if you can find somebody who is able to be like removed and more objective to act as that um, kind of mediator to hear, that's a great feedback mechanism. Uh, to, to incorporate into, into teams. Okay, so the last of three topics I was especially interested in asking you about is I actually, you started to talk about, and I wanna learn more about it, the idea of like agile and data science. So, um, you know, for our listeners, agile is like a very software development practice of iterating on things more quickly versus traditional like waterfall is like, we're gonna make a three month roadmap of every step. Um, so I am particularly interested to you because for this, for you, because I have been at consulting firms that were very waterfall and they struggled to go to agile, especially in data science. And like I, as a data science, they struggled because, you know, the idea of agile is you split everything up into this small, discrete sets of work. Like, and then you, at, at the last minute, you kind of choose as quickly as possible. Okay, now we'll do this work and I will do this work. But like data science, it's hard to do that with because like, you don't know how long it's going to take to train a model. You don't know what the model is going to say. The model, you may have to try three different models. Like, how do you, which leads me to my question, how do you think about adapting agile principles to data science in particular? So like, what are the parts of agile that work for you? What are the parts of agile you change, you don't use? Like, how does agile and data science work? Um, so... Having some 
high level objectives that you can be aiming for on a sprint to sprint basis, I think are very reasonable and fit in with those kind of like bigger picture, more senior leader that would, whoever you're doing your work for, they're expecting something from you at some point. And uh, rather than saying, here's what I'm gonna give you three months from now, being able to say, look, at the end of two sprints, here's what we're planning to have in place. The end of four sprints, here's what we're having planned to have in place. And then at the end of six sprints, right? And I, if you, I love two week sprints and kind of huge believer in it being like the perfect time window, uh, <laughs> but that's a separate, a separate topic. But on that kind of time scale, um, six sprints gives you three months. That's a quarter of a year. A lot of people like at more management level think and act on quarters for quarterly planning. And um, kind of two sprints worth of duration, a month worth of work, you should be able to have enough, you should be able to have enough clarity on what your objectives are at a high level to be able to say, month one, we'll have this done. Month two, we'll have this done. Month three, we'll have this done. And that, from that, backing off from that, to be able to say, these are some of the steps for the things that we're going to be executing in the first sprint of this month and the second sprint of this month. This puts us in a position to have an outline for a structure for our, um, like our North Star overall and some milestones along the way, right? So this is an anchor piece that I rely on for uh, teams that I'm working with. And wherever possible, I try to escape the Gantt chart. It's, I'm happy if partners I'm working with have sold to our clients a Gantt chart of this person, this, you know, 12 people, these roles and little, you know, chevrons connected across weeks, across three months. But that's basically a waterfall plan, probably that I've been involved in creating two months before the project even begins, before we have ever looked at data or talked to actual uh, business people like who are our, our peers, like our daily working peers on the project. And so as long as we all understand that it's a little bit of a dream, uh, that's great. The challenge is, I think, to Jacqueline, what you were suggesting, when you get in a situation where with very little information, we've built a 12 person, three month plan, which is four person years worth of work. And then an expectation that we're gonna execute on that exactly on a day by day, maybe not day by day, but at least week by week basis, right? That just, uh, reality never comes close to that. I was smiling while you're talking because you were describing exactly consulting projects at Beyond where the senior person's like, we're gonna do 12 weeks and this person's gonna do this and this week. And then you're like, how? How could you ever do that? And I had a manager who did that then later go to me and be like, you need to work more agile. And it's like, you gave me the Gantt chart. <laughs> me the Gantt chart. That's right. Yeah. And, and so the blend between um, the plan that's an idea of what might happen, understanding that that's not a contract of what will happen, while still maintaining some key milestones and objectives and having a North Star of like, what's the key business value that we're that we're aiming for. That I think it puts you in a good position to avoid uh, the, the initial project plan becoming a contract of work and then everybody's stuck in waterfall style. And the flip side of that is consulting teams and not you know, like people in all sorts of companies can end up on the flip side of agile, meaning no plan. Um, you know, I would say agile is no plan and you do what I tell you to do during stand up today, or you do whatever you feel like. And during stand up, you tell me what you feel like doing today. This is also not agile. Um, this is just anarchy. And um, on that basis, again, coming back to the comments I made earlier, strong pyramids with the right levels of like seniority and accountability and planning and feedback should put a team in a position where there are clear, high level objectives, maybe two, three, four objectives for the team over a two week sprint. And then a set of tasks, probably somewhere between 60 to 80%, you should have a pretty good idea of these are the things we're aiming to get done and understanding that 20 to 40%, uh, you're not gonna know. You'll have task injection, you'll have some task churn, some things you won't get to and other things you'll pull forward, but more often just new stuff will come up, right? As you, as you learn and discover. And normally by the time you're in the second week of your sprint, your next sprint, which also should have some high level objectives in place, you, you gain your clarity on what your next sprint should look like. And you make some adjustments on what your high level goals are, what your tasks are. And those are the pieces that um, I certainly look to put in place on my teams. It's what we, we train. We have a project leader, gamma project leader training course. That's like a five day, five half day uh, training that we do. And part of that is around how do we do agile data science? And it's talking about exactly some of these details about when we're dealing with um, 
lots of uncertainties in data, lots of uncertainties in terms of modeling approach, but how do we capture those and how do we say, well, these are the things we're going to experiment and we might do these things next. That's the, the last part I'm going to add into this is an agile um, component of agile planning that I found very powerful and I, I believe is still really underutilized is um, velocity tracking. And this is tied to sizing and not t-shirt sizing, but story point sizing um, tasks so that you're then able to talk about individual and team velocity. When you have good and clear communication in your team, then it's no problem saying that one person's got a velocity of two story points per sprint or four story points per sprint versus another person on the same team who's at six or seven story points per sprint. If everybody's like respected and you have open conversations on the team, then there are going to be real reasons for that. And everybody knows, even if you don't talk about it, like people know that so-and-so is only getting like a couple tasks done. It's probably because they're like the IT data support person. There's a ton of like non-task tracked activities that they're involved in. Or in other cases, they just got out of college or they've done, done a transfer from like a different area to now they're doing gamma data science and it's like exciting to have them on board but they really it's totally new to them and so you only expect them to do one or two story points in a sprint while you're doing five or six or something like that right so you have an open conversation about it and the amount that gives you for serious conversation around time boxing of effort on tasks and uh, be able to plan and talk about impacts of different um, you know what you're able to do as a team what your next sprint looks like upward communication to more senior people, being realistic within your team about your team velocity and ability to get done what you've got in your current sprint, to start your next sprint and say, okay, guys, like the last three sprints, we've covered 25 story points. This sprint, we've got 35 story points. Nothing's changed in our team size. Like we clearly have like 50% more work than we can do here. Um, it's, it's hugely empowering. Uh, and I think it's an underutilized piece of doing, um, doing agile methods in a data science context. And a lot of people are like, well, I can't do that. I'm like, look, it's just a guess for your task, what your tasks are and what the sizes are. You're gonna do what makes sense on a day by day basis, but let's try and track it and let's get better together at, estimate, at figuring out what the tasks are, what the sequence of tasks are and how hard they are. And uh, it, it's always worked for me. I mean, yeah. for 20 years, it's worked for me. I was an early XP extreme programming before it was called agile person. <laughs> and um, I, everybody I've worked with loves it. I love that. I've drunk the Kool-Aid. So, it's, um, so I didn't know it used to be called extreme programming. That's a great name, but uh, I'm thinking about it. Yeah. I've worked on a number of agile teams and not all of them really like, you know, some, you know, some of them point to very level, varying levels of caring about it, but then they really like it is rare, I think, to have for me to have been on teams where they actually really looked at like, well, how many points are we doing this week compared to last week, things like that. And I agree with you. I do think that's a useful tool. I don't know why. I think maybe it's just because it feels like a lot of work to get people to assign the points. You know, like you got to all vote with your fingers or whatever to figure out how much effort each thing is. But um, okay. And then let my last question before for you before we open it up to any audience questions. And I saw we have one, but audience members, if you have any other questions, now's a great time to write them. Um, so my last question to you is, so how do you kind of, when you're managing a team and you're doing agile, you have all these things going on, how do you keep, I'm going to try and word this nicely. We data scientists, we have a, a, a tendency to go and just kind of explore the things we think are interesting, right? You want to be like, oh, well, what if I tried a neural network? What if I tried cutting the data this way? sometimes those aren't really that helpful for work and they're more like, well, you're kind of curious, but there's not a good work use for it. How do you keep the data scientists focusing on the stuff that is valuable to the team? Um, you know, how do you kind of make sure people stay aligned with the same goal? Um, just, yeah, that's my question. So this is a big challenge. Um, the most effective, what makes it an especially hard challenge in a BCG context is that our tight timelines mean that we, we have not a lot of exploratory time. We have exploratory time measured in hours, not days. Um, and that doesn't mean hours overall for the whole project, but it means for any given like big piece of work, we can't spend days figuring out what we're gonna do. We have to spend days, we spend days planning, but not days evaluating like three different options sort of thing. That's kind of the best way to put it. We have to make like quick decisions on the path we're gonna follow. And then for sure we can put invest, you know, as much time as it takes to get a design piece right and to have like an iterative process that works correctly. 
So the desire and then tendency for data scientists and even software engineers um, to want to try and experiment a bunch of different things, read a bunch of blog posts, try some new libraries. This is something we've really got to be careful about. What we do bigger picture is that we give people avenues to explore those things through other projects rather than like the specific client facing projects that they're engaged in. We have a number of different pro pro uh, programs within uh, BCG and Gamma that give people lots of space either on their own or with other people to do exploratory work. Um, and then we've got this special concept that's called magic time. And magic time is, you're welcome to do that, but it's kind of on your own time. Uh, and so we call that magic time. But if it's project related, it really needs to be uh, pretty tightly focused in terms of the timelines and where you're investing your time. And this is why um, a pretty strict agile methodology, um, which I'd say when agile is done well, it's actually very regimented. It's a very regimented kind of like mechanism for which leads to good clarity, but doesn't leave you a lot of kind of space to do your own thing. Um, what, what I aim for and what teams I work with aim for are uh, tasks that one of my sayings is you don't let the sun set twice on a task. And so we break down work into, in my story point sizing, it's an expert uh, expert engineer or data scientist uh, can complete one story point of work in one uninterrupted day. So like that means zero meetings, uninterrupted day is zero meetings. Um, and so if somebody has a two story point task, then if they have two uninterrupted days, they can complete it and they can complete it with like the sun setting one song kind of thing, right? And so if we break down our task to half a story point, one story point, two story points in my story point sizing system. People have tasks that are broken down to make sure that they've got two or three tasks a week that they're responsible for. And on that basis, we have a checkpoint because our, our ability to estimate the size and complexity of things is kind of about 50% accurate. And so if we've got something which we say could take two days, well, it might take three days. And if we really got it badly wrong, it might take four days, but it's not going to take 10 days, right? And so this means the amount of space that somebody can go off in the wrong direction um, or go off exploring, but not come back uh, or not feed back into what we're doing is, is limited. It's kind of time limited to half a day or a day at, a, at the most. And so that system is how we have these very like tight feedback cycles of tasks that are short, that should be finished by, you know, the end of the day tomorrow, or really if it needed to the next day, but means that there's a limited space for people wandering off. Now, a lot of people can find that constraining and that's why we need to find other mechanisms. And we maybe create a task. If somebody says, hey, I think this could really be valuable for us. There have been times when I've given people, you know, uh, two days to go and explore something with the understanding that it could just be like a learning exercise and nothing comes back into the project from it except some new knowledge and it leads to some of the professional development interests of that individual. But we time box it and we plan for it and it's tracked as a task. And that's, um, that. I'd say those are the key things that we do. We don't leave people to just say, oh, here's what we're doing at the start of sprint planning. We'll check in two Fridays from now and see how it's all gone, right? That's, that's not agile and that's not a successful strategy uh, for and really for anyone. People don't feel connected, purposeful, or like they're contributing to, um, an overall uh, project. Got it, good, okay. Well, so thank you for answering my questions. And I have one question from an audience member, um, which and I think this is a great question, um, which is what advice would you give for someone who is starting as the organization's first data science, like they are starting the first data science team there, they're gonna be heading that. So they don't have the infrastructure in place of an existing company. Um, yeah. Yeah, what would you recommend? Yeah, great question. So if you're, it's different to be the first data scientist from setting up the first data science team. They uh, ask for a team. Yeah, Sorry, so I read it. Up, yeah, I heard you say that. I just want to make okay. sure I, I distinguish in my responses concerning setting up the first data science team. Um, so I think the first most important piece is understanding who the sponsors are for that team and what their objectives are and what they're looking for. Now, the sponsors should be pretty clear. Um, you might not understand right right away who they are, but you probably figured out, if you don't already know, you'd probably be able to figure that out by talking to the, the people around you around who 
who pulls the levers, who are the people who have the greatest interest in this, and then you talk to them and you'll get a sense of whether it's, uh, you know, how important it is to them and their understanding of what needs to be done. Once you understand who are the key sponsors, then understanding what, are, what is the business opportunity or the business objectives that that data science team is going to serve. And that one could be a lot harder because there could be uh, the senior business leaders who understand that they want the organization to be more data and analytics driven and not just like business reporting and kind of like 1990s style, um, like kind of dashboards and aggregations of numbers, but actually, um, you know, modeling based and insight based and predictive and kind of like future looking and um, this sort of thing. And they, they could understand that that's a capability that they want, but they're unclear about where that's actually going to fit into the organization. Is that then going to require that data science team lead to have uh, to invest time into finding those opportunities and floating some ideas and, and painting some pictures of a few different opportunities and seeing which ones have some um, are going to gain some traction. That's going to be happening concurrently with actually building the team. So that's the most important thing. So you got to know where you're you got to know where you're going so you can bring in the right people. Um, and give them clarity and direction. Uh, but while you're figuring out what your business objectives are, then uh, actually building out a team, I would say now that I've had the experience that I've had at BCG, teams that incorporate the right mix of software engineers, data scientists, uh, data engineers, DevOps, IT systems engineers, that's kind of like uh, your jack of all trades, right? Your DevOps engineer sort of thing. Sometimes, depending on the complexity of the system, you get into having like an AI ML engineer, but probably if it's a first team, the key things are going to be data scientist, software engineer, data engineer, and some kind of systems engineer that can act as kind of like the infrastructure cloud engineer person or just IT systems engineer. That Those four hats need to be worn by people who are on that team, even if it's only a two or three person team. Um, and then it's a matter of having the people that you can work well with and that you, that you have the right mix of skills and abilities. Uh, I have really come around from the view of, hey, wouldn't it be great if a whole bunch of people that are like me get together and we do some cool stuff together to thinking it's a lot better if we've got, I like Jacqueline shaking her head that way. You need people with different backgrounds and experiences. I'd also say it's critical you have people at different career steps. If you had a whole bunch of people who are at the same career level, um, it's just, it just leads to like awkward dynamics because everybody has sort of equally right opinions that could be quite different <laughs> about what you do. And that just leads to like decision-making and leadership uh, challenges. Works fine in an academic setting, works fine in an open source development setting, works terribly in a commercial setting uh, from, from my experience. So I think those would be my, my main um, kind of guide, my main guidance on how to do that. And the last bonus that I'll toss in there is that it can be really hard to bootstrap a data science team these days. So you gotta figure out what your priorities are, whether it's getting people on the ground and having that, that team of people in-house and then growing it over a long time, or if the number one priority is some business impact. The number one priority is gaining some business impact and you've identified what that is. BCG is not gonna be the right people to come to, right? You should go and like kind of outsourced to a data science team that you, the leader, can work with and lead that small team because you know what the problem is. You just need the people to execute on it. And it's tough to get that team from the market right away on the ground operating and, and executing. Uh, but consider getting some outsourced team to bootstrap the process while you're concurrently recruiting so that you get the right people. Much more important to get the right people than to get the wrong people and try and make do with them. So. So, okay, so I will like, so first off, I think it's great that you mentioned you could just hire consultants to do stuff. I will also just briefly, in the interest of self-promotion, mention that if you are a data science, leading a, creating a data science team, everything you do is going to set a precedent. You choose Python, you choose R, whatever you do is going to make it really, if you choose Python, it's going to be really hard for people to use R, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, like you are, every step you're going to set a precedent. If you use a platform like Saturn Cloud for your data science, it might make a lot of that easier by just creating a, you know, you are setting the precedent of, hey, we want to have things on the cloud and easy. So that is a product that is good. Thinking about how you're going to keep people from, in, from a situations where like, I can't do work because all I have is a laptop is valuable as well. Okay. So with that, 
thank you very much for joining us, Ian. This was a lot of fun. Um, and I, honest to God, learned a few things. So I'm like, oh, I should think about this differently on, uh, you know, when I'm running teams and things like that. So yeah, thank you. I really uh, appreciated having you here. Thanks, Jack. Uh, yes. Okay. And with that, we'll stop recording and say goodbye to everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye.